this video is for those of you who have been trained as a mechanic, but it's been a while since you last did a brake job. Maybe you need a refresher. This is not a fundamentals course on how the brakes work. And if you're looking for that, uh, go ahead and check out the Bendix Air Brake School as it's free and a really great resource. So with that said, let's get right to it. First thing is to get the truck wheels that are not going to be lifted off the ground chalked. This is to prevent the vehicle from rolling, especially since we'll be releasing the brakes and lifting the axles to replace those brake components. Next, you want to dump the airbags of the suspension to prevent the vehicle from rolling off the stands. If the vehicles deflate during the repair, they can pull the vehicle off the stands. Always make sure that the suspension airbags are deflated using the dash switch or by disconnecting the ride height control valve and manually dumping that suspension. Now it's time to lift the axle you're going to be working on. Now it's very common to lift in the center of an axle, but you do need to be aware that if the vehicle you're lifting is a heavy vocational truck like a garbage truck or a hydrovac, there is a lot of weight even when it's not fully loaded. And if you use a narrow jack head, you run the risk of pushing through the cast housing on the axle. If you're lifting a steer axle, you can run the risk of bending the axle and changing the camber of the vehicle, increasing tire wear and affecting steering and control performance. To prevent this, try and lift as close as you can to the U-bolts that connect the axle to the spring pack or trailing arm while still allowing yourself space to install the jack stands. Other solutions are to use a rotary wheel jack to lift the vehicle onto stands or to put a plate on top of the jack head to spread out the load pressure and reduce the point load on the cast housing of that axle. Always make sure that you're working on a vehicle that has been placed on rated jack stands and that the vehicle has been locked out or prevented from accidental starting. Make sure you're following your shop's procedures for this. If you're not sure what stands to use as you choose which ones to put on your vehicle, make sure you're using stands that have one, the manufacturer's lock pin is in place, as well as two, make sure that the capacity is correct. As a rule of thumb, you can take the tear weight of a truck and divide it by three to get the stand rating, as long as you're working with an unloaded truck. If the truck you're working on is carrying material, when you're working on it, use the gross vehicular weight or the gross GVW. Divide that by three. You always divide by three because like a stool, you usually only end up putting all the weight on three of the four stands. So on a stool, three of four legs. Now that you have the bags dumped, the wheels chalked, the axle in the air, it's time to bust the wheels off. To get them off, it's most effective to use a large air, like a one inch impact. While the wheels are usually only installed with fasteners tightened to four to 500 foot pounds, electric impacts like the half inch Milwaukee or DeWalt or Rigid often struggle to get the wheels off. The three quarter versions are better, but since speed is essential in a truck shop, just commit to the larger air gun to make the work go as smooth as possible. In our test run in our shop, we had a Milwaukee half inch with a six amp hour high capacity battery fully charged and in the time it took to complete one wheel, we knocked the three other wheel ends off with the air gun. So it's just faster. Of course, you always need to show care to the customer's rims and hardware, and this includes making sure that you remove the indicator tabs, the beauty covers, the hubcap covers, as carefully as possible, and keeping them with the wheel ends. To get the indicator tabs off and the center hubcaps, I find a rolling heel bar most helpful. So make sure you grab one at the beginning of this job from your box. When you remove the hardware from the wheel, make sure to check that the washers on the hub mounted wheel are able to spin freely. If they're sticky, they can be lubed with, most manufacturers say one drop of oil between the washer and the nut. Just make sure not to get any lube on the threads themselves. If the washers are unable to turn freely, make sure to replace the nut as they will not torque properly and the wheel could come off during operation. Wheel off accidents are unfortunately common, but absolutely are preventable. As you remove the wheel assemblies, use a long pry bar or wheel dolly to lift them and move them around to prevent back injuries and to prevent the rims from being dinged on the end of the axle housing. When removed, keep the wheel pairs together. If you have a laborer helping you, this is a great time to have them buff off the mounting surfaces of the wheel 
to make sure that when they are reinstalled, they will mount true and the clamp load of the fasteners will prevent the wheel off incidents. If you don't have a labor, I guess you're doing it yourself. So now you have the wheels off and the drums are now showing. At this point, make sure that you back off the slack adjusters to make it easier to remove that drum. If there's tapered wear or uneven wear or contamination ribs in the drum, they can make it really hard to pull that drum off of the studs. Even with the brakes released, this can be a challenge. So you're gonna need to make sure that that slack adjuster is backed off and you're gonna have to back it off anyway when you install the new shoes. With the slack adjusters backed off, go ahead and give that drum a big old smack with a large sledgehammer. This will snap the shoes back if they've settled into a groove and make removing the drums that much easier. With the smacks laid, go ahead and slide those drums off the hub. Make sure to lift with your legs and try not to reach as much as you can. Okay, the drums are good and heavy. Make sure not to blow your brake dust around the shop as you're moving the drums and cleaning the backing plates and the dust off of the brake area as, you know, brake dust can cause long-term occupational illness. So try not to blow it around. At this point, you should have the brake shoes exposed. To remove them, simply pop off the return springs with a pry bar, roll the top one over the axle, and allow both shoes to hit the ground. You are going to be replacing the springs with the new shoes anyway. It's a good idea at this point to grease the slack adjuster tube to check to see that your outboard S-cam seal isn't leaking. So if you put some grease in there and you see that the grease is coming out into the wheel assembly or the brake area, then you know you have to replace that seal. Usually a leaking seal is an indicator of worn bushings, so if you see grease leaking into the wheel end, be prepared to replace the bushings and the seal. Take a couple minutes to scrape off the brake dust and the gunk that tends to build up, and if your brakes have a replaceable anchor pin, make sure to knock them out of the spider and install the new ones that come with the kit. Always replace those anchor pins, they do wear. Always check your new brake parts that are in the kit to see that they match the old ones. Clean off any surface rust, any packing grease, or any stickers that may have been placed on by the manufacturers, especially if they're in the friction surfaces inside the drum. So at this point, install the rollers into the new brake shoes, connect the large return spring to both shoes, and with the large return spring connected, you're able to hang the top shoe and using a pry bar, pop the lower shoe into place with the roller resting on the S-cam. Pull the side with the smaller return springs together, it should snap together. And when it comes time to connect the small return springs, this is when all the little tools and tricks really start to come out. Some people try and use a screwdriver and pliers and brute force, and I find this leads to often stabbing yourself. Okay, so injury, and it's frankly not that fast. There are a set of spring pliers that you can order, and they lock into the part of the spring that forms a right angle, and then you pry against the other shoe to stretch the spring in place. My favorite though, and I think it's the simplest to use, is a pry bar with a, a hook on the side of it. You can hook onto the spring, and after you've put the one end on the brake shoe, either prying against the spindle, the hub, or simply by pushing, because you got some leverage, you can stretch that spring, and twisting the handle of the pry bar, you can get it locked into the other shoe. Just make sure that the spring has been clipped on fully before moving on, and make sure that the coil of the return spring is not going to be making contact with the anchor pin as it will increase wear and possibly lead to spring failure. With the return springs installed, the shoe rollers should be sitting on the S-cam and the return springs should be holding the shoes retracted and parallel to one another when we look at the top and bottom of the shoe. If one shoe is riding up, make sure to pry it over so that they're parallel before sliding the drum back over the hub and shoe assembly. It's a good practice to clean the wheel studs and inspect them for stretching, hourglassing. Okay, so make sure those threads are inspected before installing the drum and the wheels. Make sure that if you're cleaning the threads, you are not leaving any lubricants behind as most wheels are to be installed dry. It may come as a surprise, but most wheel off issues come not from the tires being too loose at the install moment, but instead from wheel hardware that has been over torqued and stretched. And this is what usually leads to the hardware failing and the wheels coming loose during operation. 
So with the threads clean, the drum slipped over, you can now install the wheels. I prefer to use a pry bar to line up the wheels and get them over the axles and aligned with the wheel studs. When installing dual wheel assemblies, make sure to offset the valve stems of the two tires by 180 degrees or half a rotation if possible and make sure that the valve stems are accessible so that the tire pressures can be checked and topped up when needed. When installing the wheel hardware, make sure that the hub piloted wheel is pushed back onto the hub before rattling in that hardware. You can damage the hub or you can damage the rim if you try and use the hardware to pull it past the hub supports where they're supposed to be aligned. When you're ready to rattle on the hardware, make sure to install them and tighten them below the torque value. In other words, don't hold the impact on too long or you will over torque and can stretch the hardware. You want the torque wrench to rotate on the hardware a little bit before it clicks, beeps or pops depending on your torque wrench. Also, make sure to always install your hardware in a torque sequence that follows the manufacturer's wheel torque spec. This often allows for flush square install and even clamp load. For those of you at Foothills Group, the common wheel torques have been provided in a quick reference sheet, in a poster in the shop, as well as in your binder. Now that the wheels are installed, we want to adjust the brakes. We want to do that by turning the slack adjuster adjustment mechanism until the brakes are applied and the wheel is held by the brakes. We then back off that adjuster by half a turn and check to make sure that that wheel can turn with a slight drag. Some, some slack adjusters have a lock you need to hold back to be able to back off the slack adjusters while others just make a ratcheting noise as you back them off. If you hear a loud ratcheting noise from the slack adjuster during adjustment, don't worry, it's perfectly normal. Make sure that the slack adjuster is operating properly in the adjustment and that the clevis pin and the push rod are not seized in that pin. The clevis pin should be able to turn in the clevis. If not, you will have to remove it, clean the bore, clean the pin and reinstall it. When you think you've torqued all the fasteners, give them one more check before installing those beauty caps or the wheel covers and make sure you install those indicators. With the wheel on, you can lower the truck off the stands, remove the chocks and complete the cleanup in the service report. This video has covered how to complete a common S-cam brake shoe and drum replacement. If during your repair you notice things like clevis pins that are seized, brake pots that are damaged, S-cam seals that are leaking, bushings that are excessively worn, or wheel seals that are leaking, make sure to add an additional line to your service order to make sure that those, those issues are addressed and properly charged for and make sure our customers communicated with and they approve the work. Time is money and especially in a repair shop. So make sure you understand where your common tooling is placed, your own tools are, and what you need to complete this job to prevent additional trips back and forth to your toolbox or to the parts area. Our customers should be paying for our experience and not for our lack of organization. Hopefully this was helpful for you. See you next time.